Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Scott Wurzbacher, and today's episode is a testimonial to how following your own call to adventure can become a story that ultimately inspires others to take action for themselves. We are visited by a truly extraordinary adventurer today, a return guest from our very first episode of the Inspire Campfire podcast. Josh Sutton is back with us today, and he's here to share an update of all that's happened for him since he, his wife, and their five-year-old son through hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2021, making his son Harvey the youngest person to complete the journey. Their life-changing seven-month hike has led to all sorts of new adventures, including the making of a documentary about their time on the trail. Adventure often leads to more adventure, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Josh, welcome back to the campfire. Hey, thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. It was it was so much fun. I think it's been three years since I was on the podcast last. Yeah, that's exactly right. And man, I mean, so much has transpired for you and, you know, the way this podcast has evolved, like you being number one has just set the stage for, you know, so many uh, amazing conversations that I've gotten to have. You definitely gave me the juice to to want to keep talking to people. So I definitely have you to thank there. And I, we'll get into more of that too, but I'm just so excited to have you back. There's, there's so much that's happened and I just want to get an update from you. Well, that's great. Let's, let's definitely catch up. Yeah, man. So, um, so in episode one of the podcast, you came on and shared the story of how you, your wife, Cassie and Harvey, your son, who was five at the time had just come back from through hiking the Appalachian trail. And if I'm not mistaken, our conversation was probably in like October. And, uh, I think you guys had just finished a couple of months prior. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, yeah, we were fresh off the trail, still trying to uh, figure out what life was like back back home and and living in uh, our house and and not living in a tent every day. Yeah, a topic for today's conversation for sure. So I just wonder, I I would definitely love for listeners to go back and re-listen to episode one. We're not going to revisit the whole story today because that's available. But uh, I just wonder if you could just, uh, for those listeners, if you could just kind of recap a little bit about the journey that you guys took back in 2021. Yeah. So um, before that, me and my wife had a dream to do many retirements throughout our lives. And we decided to schedule one when our son was four years old. So we decided uh, to hike the Appalachian Trail, which is uh, 2,200 miles. It goes from Georgia to Maine, crosses 14 states. And uh, we left in January in the middle of the snow. Um, and if you go back and watch the, the documentary, uh, it's it was crazy hard. The winter was a very, very tough part of the journey. But then we, we bonded to close together and it took us 290 nine days to complete the journey and and we finished it and um and we were able to uh, to i guess tell the story <laughs> yeah i mean it it's so good so uh, you could you kind of just let the a little bit of the cat out of the bag there because there's a movie now about you and i mentioned it in the intro but uh yeah i mean so now this this story that you guys created by going and just following the voice that called you guys to adventure and and uh, and going on this trip is now a full length documentary i was able to get it on amazon and uh it's incredible i mean just documents the entire journey and uh yeah i mean i'd love to just talk a little bit about what that's been like for you to 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 create a movie um about this this journey well, it was it was hard. Uh, it was it was a lot of work. It took us over a year to put it together. My friend, he's a filmmaker, and he's done a lot of different, uh, you know, kind of low budget films. And he wanted to do a documentary about our trip. At first, he was kind of just joking around with it, and he decided to do interviews with me, my wife, and my son before we left. But once we started going, we started YouTubing everything. So I've been took a ton of video with my phone and just sending everything back to him so he could start editing it. And he got really excited. He's like, whoa, this is going to be really good. Uh, so he started working really hard while we were still on the trail. He met us several times on the trail to do even further interviews. Um, he went and met the, the longest guy to ever hike the trail, volunteers at the Appalachian Trail Museum, uh, Harvey's pediatrician. And then when we got back from 
we had uh, back from the trail, we had to go straight to kindergarten. So he interviewed the teacher and some other families that also hiked the trail with young kids. So he did a lot of work. Um, and I think his first draft was over 80 hours wow. worth of film. Just, just insane. And then we were able to quickly cut that down to about six hours. And he would come over to our house every night for uh, probably a month. And we would just rewatch it over and over again. And it was heartbreaking for my wife and myself, Cassie, to just cut, cut, <laughs> cut, cut down to two hours. And, and that was just a nightmare because when you're spending 209 days on the trail, a lot of stuff happens, a lot of great stories. Um, so it was, I don't know if, you know, if your listener has been involved in too much, you know, movie editing, but cutting is, is really hard, especially when you have that much footage. Yeah, hundred percent. And so I, I guess I'm curious because the the two hour version is available right to the general public. Is there a six hour version that's reserved for friends and family? Uh, well, it's it's not edited well. Uh, it's just very choppy, and then it doesn't you know doesn't have you know the sound effects and and good music or anything like that. So there there is one I have on my computer. I, I think the one I kept was like four hours long. Um, but I don't know if I'll ever go back and listen to it just because it's so long. I love it. So it sounds like when you guys set out on this journey, the idea of creating a documentary was always kind of in the back of mind. Because, I mean, and you know, with the footage that you guys have is really good. It's very professionally done. I was kind of curious about that. Yeah. Like, like I said, my friend that's a filmmaker, he met us several times on the trail. So he drove out a couple of places. Other than that, it was mostly my phone and he would call me up regularly or send me messages where I'm on the trail and be like, hey, hold your camera steady more, do this, more of that. So he kind of coached me a little bit. And we had our YouTube channel as well. And our, our YouTube channel actually did really well. We we got a bunch of subscribers. I think we're up to, I mean, not a bunch, but 8,000 maybe. I guess it's small in the YouTube world, but for us, it was a lot. But yeah, so it was just fun keeping keeping the YouTube because at, at the end of the day, if he decided not to finish the documentary, we could still have the memories via YouTube. So that's why we, we worked really hard to keep that up. Yeah. So the movie is called Beyond the Tree Line. Again, listeners uh, must go and, and get it. Is it available at Amazon, any place else they can find it, Josh? Yeah, yeah. Apple TV has it. Uh, Google uh, uh, Google Play has it. Uh, Comcast has it. Pretty much anywhere where you can buy movies on demand. I, my friend, he just got back from a cruise on Royal Caribbean, and he said our movie was the only documentary on Royal Caribbean on that particular really? cruise, which is funny. Yeah, wow. so he 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 found it on on his the cruise ship as well. So it's pretty much anywhere where you can find movies on demand. Yeah, on an adventure on a cruise ship, you can watch a documentary about adventure. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I love that. I'm I'm really curious for you. Like, what is it like to have a movie that's been made about this trip? It's really awesome. Uh, I'm just glad it's done, though. At the end of the day, it's it took us almost three years to get out, a year to make it after the trip, and then from there we had to sell it to a uh, distributing company that's in Cal based out of California. Um, so during that whole process, it was really surreal. The the most biggest surreal moment of having your own movie, we actually rented out um, a theater here in our, our town, Lynchburg, and did a nice. local premiere. And, and I did it kind of as a client party for all my real yeah. estate clients and then still with the general public. We had several hundred people that were all stuffed in this theater to take a look at it. And that, that part was really surreal, just watching people's faces, watch our family movie but it's so well done everyone loved it and the feedback was just just great and you know my son he he loved to tell his friends uh at school you know in, in first grade and they all thought it was the best um now that it's actually released i actually we bought it on amazon but we haven't actually watched it i've seen it so many times where it's just like let me i need a couple of year break <laughs> and then i'll watch it again <laughs> yeah man i love that so much i mean and just for listeners too like for anybody that's thinking about hiking the appalachian trail i mean it's it's really in depth and it gives you a really good sense of what that hike is like. And, you know, especially some of that footage, cause you, you all started in January and it was, it was really snowy in the beginning. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was funny. Uh, some of the feedback we got from a lot of different people, actually, there are several people that have hiked the trail before. And when they started the movie, the comments were always the same. We always get these messages back where the, the first half of it, we're like, I can't believe they took their kid out there and they risked their kid's life. And they're like, they, they couldn't believe it. And then at the end of the movie, they're just like, what? Like that was such a great family adventure. I don't, I don't, you can speak from your experience too, yeah. but um, at the beginning it was hard. It was hard in the winter, but that brought us really close together. I don't think I would go back and change that. Um, even though the winter was so hard and so much snow, I think we had, I think it was 40, the first 45 days rained or snowed a little bit every single day. 
Um, so it was very wet and, and cold in the beginning. So I think that's really interesting thing worth us chatting about briefly, because what you just talked about was like, before you did it, you were kind of given some, like you had, you got some resistance, right? Like people that were afraid, like, is this really the wise thing to do with a five-year-old? Like, you know, maybe this isn't the smartest thing to do as a family. And now in hindsight, like looking back, people are celebrating it. Like, oh, wow, what a great thing. What an amazing situation for your son to have gone through. Like, you know, what a, it, he's so much stronger now. It's It's been great for all of you guys. Like, as you kind of look through that process, I guess I'm curious, like what your reflections are on that sort of like the reversal of that feedback that that's probably come for you guys. I don't judge anyone for judging us. So let's put it that yeah. way, because yeah. I mean, the average person to take, you know, a four year old into the depths of winter and survive that way uh, could potentially be very foolish. But I mean, our you know, our species, humanity has been doing it for thousands of years. We, yeah. we have lived by the fire and lived in shelters without insulation and without heat. Um, and if you have the right gear and the right training, it's really not much of a risk at all. So for us, we knew we weren't risking anything because we took the right precautions and we knew what we were getting into. And we did a lot of training and testing ahead of time. But um, I mean, it's easy to see someone that potentially could have done that without doing all that testing. Like people didn't right. know what we have tested and what we haven't tested and all our training and just experience level going into it. Um, but knowing our experience, I'm, you know, I'm fine with people judging us a little bit, but if you watch the documentary, you'll be able to, I think, I think you can clearly yeah. see that we are ready for it and clearly see the joy um, and the bonding that our family developed through that whole journey. Hey everyone, it's Scott here. Did you know that the members of my real estate team, W Realty Group, are listening to their own voices that call to adventure by setting big goals? Some of those goals include planning trips to Bali and the Kingdom of Bhutan, buying investment homes and running the Chicago Marathon. At W Realty Group, we support and encourage these big goals and wanna help turn them into reality. We're currently looking to add new members to the team. If you know a great real estate agent in the Charlotte, North Carolina area that would benefit from being part of our team, please send a text, an email, or give me a call. And know that when you support W Realty Group, you're also supporting this podcast. Thanks for listening. Yeah, and I don't want to give anything away in the movie, but there's a part at the end where you guys are um, in conflict with, I guess, like Park Service or something on whether or not um, Harvey could uh, summit Mount Katahdin, which is the end. And there's so there's a little bit of drama there. That was that was really cool. And then to be able to watch sort of the decision making process, uh, that was a lot of fun and uh, provided a little bit of a little bit of good drama in the movie. Yeah, yeah, that was a, a big political win. You know, we had to get on a conference call. We emailed senators and and whatnot to try to get permission to go up the last mountain. Um, the last mountain is very hard, and and I actually got to. I, we might talk about this later, but I got uh, to go up that mountain again this last year with Harvey, which yeah, was awesome. Totally. Well, I, I think you know the the thing there is just like coming back to what we were talking about before. It just speaks to like his preparedness. I mean, the fact that he was able to do the 2000 miles that led up to that point. Like clearly he was trained and prepared and capable. So, um, right. Exactly. So watch the movie to find out what happens, but that, that part was pretty cool. So Josh, at the end of the movie, well, and I guess I would say like having gone through the conversation that we had in episode one, and I think that was like a 30 minute conversation, then actually getting to watch the whole movie. Like I felt like I got to relive all of that with you, which was, was really cool. And to see like even more detail of it in the, in the movie itself. But, um, at the end of the movie, I heard you say multiple times, like there was this, there was this sort of point where you were like almost in disbelief about the trip being over and like not even not believing that you were going to be going back to quote real life and uh you know the concern of like getting back to work and the stress and so i guess i'm just curious like how that now that you've got all of this hindsight how did that work out for you well i mean to tell you the truth so there's this thing called hiker depression a lot of people mm -hmm. that have done the appalachian trail get off the trail and they have uh hiker depression for for several months and that was no different for us it was hard coming back to like you say quote unquote real life 
you know, we had to get back to work. You know, we're not made of money. We don't have a trust fund or anything like that. So we had to get right back to work and right back to the grind. Harvey had to start school. My wife, um, you know, had to balance always being with her son to sending him off to school all day and starting to work with me again in the real estate world. Um, so all that together, the first six months were, was very hard. It, we, we did. We, we bickered um, mm -hmm. a lot uh, because I think we were both just processing um, our, our new identity. You know, for, for years, my identity was in being a producer in real estate. And then my identity was also tied into what I could produce as far as the rental properties and investments I had. And then once we got onto the trail, my identity started to shift to being um, a family that can hike together. And when we got back, I'm like, yeah, I got this new identity and I love it. It felt so good. But I was trying to do real estate with this identity of a famous hiker. Um, I'm like, what? What? This doesn't work. And that struggle, it, that took a long time, probably, like I said, six months to just kind of work through our system. Now we're starting to get to the point where, you know, we're, we're starting to realize that we can actually create our own identity. Our identity in the past doesn't define us. And we're yeah. trying to restructure our lives where we can define our own identity. Um, but it, it's hard. It's, it's hard because I want to have a hiker identity. I want to be a real estate identity. But maybe I'm neither of those. Maybe I am my identity and I can define it further as we move forward in life. So that's kind of where we're at right now is, is just kind of working out the kinks in our new identities. I love that. This, this concept of identity, I mean, you're, you're choosing the identity as opposed to letting it just sort of happen to you. Right. I love this. So I'm curious because when we spoke in episode one, you had just gotten back. And I know like you were, I guess you were kind of in the early stages of that hike, hiker depression and maybe it hadn't even set in at that point because you were, you were still probably on a high from when we spoke. Um, but I'm curious now that you've had three years, what are some of the reflections that have kind of gone on in terms of like what adventure means to you and your family? So family has become really important and adventure to, to me, it, it's pure joy uh, for me, frankly. Um, what I've, what I've found is I can't experience real joy without first having some suffering behind it. Mm. Um, so when I strive for something um, and, and accomplish it, and then you get back to the hotel and you get to take a shower for the first time in a week or something. And you just have that warm water rush over you. You just feel so good. And everyone you did that adventure with also experienced that. And, and again, I, you know, I don't want to jump ahead in, in some of the questions, but, uh, but me and my son, we just got back from the hundred mile wilderness in Mount Katahdin and he's eight years old now. So it's been a while since he's hiked in the States. And, and we did that whole journey and it rained a lot on us. We were just covered in rain. We were soaked. Uh, we probably, our teeth were chattering one night with, from the wind and the cold, but we crawled into that shelter and we hung out together. We had dinner together and he never complained once, and which is amazing. And then once the rain went away, the mosquitoes came out, were biting us. Um, and then when we got back, someone asked me, how was your trip? I'm like, it was miserable but I've never had a better time in my life. And I never <laughs> felt closer to my son in my life. And when we got done, we were on the plane flying back to Virginia. Um, you know, he just had this joy on his face, just realizing that he accomplished that. So adventure to me is, is, is how you really bond with someone and, and you really bond through some sort of suffering, some sort of suffering slash accomplishment all combined mm -hmm. into one. And, and that's where true joy comes from. Um, at least for, for my personality type. Yeah. Do you think it's the contrast of like, you know, you talked about the, the hot shower, right? I mean, the hot shower is just so much better when it's like, when it comes after such a contrasting, you know, several weeks of no showers and, you know, the pain and the suffering that you had to go through. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the the contrast is is amazing, and you learn to appreciate the little things in life. You know, like for example, I can turn on the tap water and get a drink of water. Um, you know, that's it was really nice to just get water without having to filter it. I mean, it takes a long time to filter <laughs> water. You know, um, just to just to get a drink. Um, but the longer you're in civilization, so to speak, you know, you get used to that tap water and you you take it for granted, and it doesn't bring you joy anymore. So then you got to get something like. I don't know, uh, whatever your favorite beverage is to, to bring you that same joy. And then maybe that won't give you joy anymore. But so there's something about step, taking a step backwards to, to where life is a little harder, a little more struggles. And then the simple things can bring you more joy than that 
you know, fancy drink that you have at on the beach with an umbrella in it. <laughs> I love that. So Josh, I'm curious, like when you kind of look at the like progression of who you were before the Appalachian trail, who you were immediately after and, and how you've changed since then over this like three years since we last spoke. Well, the person I was before was someone just focused, was someone that was scared. Um, let's put it that way. So, I, you know, like I said, I have several investment properties and, you know, I grew up fairly poor. Um, so it was really important for me to work and provide for my family. So I was living out of fear. I was living in, in such a way where I need to invest. I need to have a retirement. I need to protect my family. Uh, so that was the person I was before. And right when we got back, I was more lost. <laughs> Let's put it that way, where it's like, well, I, I, I think, you know, I worked hard. I know I can live off a little. I don't need much to survive. And I got lots. And it's not that hard to put in some good work ethic and produce for my family. So I don't need to live out of fear anymore. But where do I go from there? And now I'm kind of transitioning to what do I want? Who do I want to be? And, and that goes back to when we talked about identity before is, you know, I wanted to shape my own identity to not one that's reactive and maybe one that's more proactive, one that I choose, which is, you know, freedom, basically, you know, to be free, to be able to choose your life and, and what you want it to be, not what others expect it to be. That was such a great explanation. I really appreciate that. Like what I just heard you say was before you went on the Appalachian Trail, you were kind of living in this sort of state of fear and this like secured, like this need for security and, and safety. And so you guys stepped out of that and into the wilderness, right? And I guess you proved to yourself during that seven month period of time that you didn't need a lot of those things that you thought you needed. Yep, exactly. So then you came back and it's almost like you said you were lost. So it's almost like the state of confusion. Well, like now we're back in that that life that we were in before, but now we realize we don't need all of these things. And I love to hear where you are now. It's like now you're kind of opening up to this like experience of like anything's possible. And it's now it's more, it seems like it's more about just like dreaming up whatever you want and then pursuing that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so there's this quote me and my wife have been talking about is basically you can do anything you want in life, but not everything. And so right now there is a there is a balance. You know, I want to be a good father. Uh, my son is starting to do sports. So I'm spending a lot of time going to soccer tournaments. Uh, he wrestles as well. So we go to some wrestling tournaments a lot. And but also I want to stay physically fit. So um, you know, I I signed up for an ultra marathon. So I'm doing that. Um nice. so it's I'm not doing as much backpacking, but I am running lots of miles in the woods. Um, so I'm trying to stay in shape so we can do these, you know, summer adventures when my son's not in school or doing sports, but I'm trying to be more flexible. So like, I want to live that life of adventure, but at the same time, I know I can choose. It's, it's up to us. We can do anything we want in this world. If I want to buy a sailboat and sail around the world, I can do that. But maybe I don't want to do that because my son really has great friends in the sports that he's involved in. So maybe I need to choose to be a dad where I can support him in his sports and do a sailboat thing later or or whatnot. Um, that's just an example. But um, but yeah, I, we do feel more free to decide what we want in life instead of being reactive and kind of pushed into it. Yeah. I mean, so is that choice like is it is it more like is it more obvious to you now that you're back, I guess? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Before I went, I did feel a little trapped in a cage where, you know, I, I was trapped. I mean, you're in the real estate world. I was trapped mm -hmm. in, uh, <laughs> you know, to whatever my clients wanted. My clients yeah. kind of controlled who I was and my identity. And I felt when I walked through the store and I see a client at the grocery store, I have to put on my face, you know, my oh, realtor yeah. face, you know, they controlled who I was. Um, but yeah, after this, um, I'm, I started to realize that, hey, life has so much more joy and freedom when you you're not trapped so yeah. i'm i try really hard i still fall back into it my insecurity sometimes but i try really hard to live live a life where i feel free and feel uh authentic yeah well i um and i i think i told you before we hit the record button here i went back and i re-listened to our conversation before getting on with you today and uh, we actually had a really good conversation in episode one about authenticity and you talked about the you know that whole like what you said about going into the grocery store and having to put your real estate face on and and how when you were on the trail 
like none of that existed. You, that just, everybody was the same and you got to be, you got to be the unique version of you on the trail and you didn't feel like you had to wear that mask. There was something else that you said in episode one that I want to touch on because at the beginning of this podcast, we say that this is about ordinary people and their extraordinary stories of adventure. And I know you're totally embraced and aligned with that on the adventure portion of your website. You have a, um, a, a statement that you seek a life filled with extraordinary stories. And so I know we're aligned with that. But one of the questions that I asked you on episode one was, do you feel like an ordinary person considering the epic adventure you had just been on? And your response was, I don't know if you remember this, but your response in episode one was that you actually at that time felt less than ordinary and you commented that maybe it was a self-esteem thing. And I was just curious if that self-esteem and confidence has changed, improved, increased since we last spoke, given everything that's gone on for you. Yeah, it, it definitely has. Uh, that self-esteem has definitely kind of kind of took uh I, I think a lot of it was because i just came back from the trail and and you know not knowing who i was and i felt like i didn't know my identity anymore um yeah. but now I'm, you know you kind of put the pieces back together and you start realizing and building yourself up that it's like hey you know i don't need to be worried about all these things anymore um you know it, if i'm extraordinary or if i'm not extraordinary it really doesn't matter uh my main goal in life and, and again this is our family mission statement is to live a life full of extraordinary stories when yeah. when i die on a bed i don't really care what you think scott but i do care that i can look back for myself and say hey during my life i did these things and and i was able to do them with people i love you know i i did them with my family i did it with my son my wife um one of the coolest things about go, doing the Appalachian Trail is I took my whole family. One of the hardest things for most people that have done the trail was the loneliness involved. We never felt lonely. Our whole family was there with us. And, and I really, really enjoyed that, having having everyone there, including my wife. And, and the reason why I say that is there's just a lot of old retired guys on the trail mm. that they leave their wives behind because it's a man adventure. They have their friends with them and they're going for a man camp out. Um, but, but doing it with your whole family, there's something special, at least for us. We, I really appreciate that. I, and I love looking back at that as well. Yeah, that's so awesome. And you already alluded. So you and Harvey went back and redid the last hundred miles of the Appalachian trail very recently. What was that like for you guys? Well, yeah, like I said before, it was just phenomenal. It was the coolest thing to remember different parts of the trail. We would go around a, this this bend and this rock, and I would see this stack of rocks, and I'm like, I remember this spot. We used to we when we went through, there were tons of blueberries. So I remember this one blueberry field where we just picked thousands of blueberries and put them in our peanut butter tortillas. Um, there weren't any blueberries this trip, but uh, we were before that they were bloom. But just to have those memories and have uh, Harvey remember them we just released a youtube uh, uh the first half of our trip uh now and and harvey narrates a lot of it but he was talking about how like the whole purpose of the trip was so he could remember it now that the documentary is out people are asking him lots of questions and since he was so young he doesn't have vivid memories of the last mountain and the last hundred miles and so doing that trip with him allowed him to remember it but man he was strong he was really strong he was a workhorse we would stop for lunch and I want to sit and relax, but he's a kid. Kids love to move. So he he's like, dad, come on, let's go. And he would give me a 10, 15 minute lunch break. I'm like, man, can we just relax here for a while? Cause we were doing 16, 17 mile days. So, um, he, he was definitely a workhorse. He was really strong and, and I was very, really impressed with him. And it's only going to be a matter of days, uh, or years till I can keep up with him. He's only eight, but, um, yeah. So now I'm training for an ultra marathon and the primary purpose is so I can luckily, hopefully do things with him when he's in high school, I'll be strong enough. Yeah. Oh man. He's such an amazing kid. How was it for, how was the last hundred miles for him? Like, did he remember being there? Like what was, what was it like for him to sort of reminisce about the experience? He remembered some, a couple spots he said he remembered, but not much. Um, but what he, I mean, I guess what he did remember was like the fun of sleeping in a shelter mm -hmm. and the fun of, you know, making up stories and, and, you know, crossing all the river crossings, the river crossings were pretty intense, um, up there this year. Cause it was so much rain in Maine. Yeah. It was, it was fun to just see how strong he was. Uh, you know, we, it was funny. He, we were at a soccer tournament, uh, a couple of weeks before and, you know, uh, for all the people out there with lots of, with, with kids, you know, 
it's a lot of fun when you see your kid excel and just crush other kids. Harvey's not necessarily the best soccer player. So he got his fair share of time on the bench. He's a little tall and lanky and a little uncoordinated. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, the other parents are, you know, really proud when their kids are all scoring. I'm just like, man, I wish, wish my son, I, I maybe I, I should give more, give him more time so he can be a better soccer player. Yeah. Then the next week we go hike the hundred mile wilderness and I can barely keep up with them. And like I said, he can handle the cold, the rain, um, the mosquitoes and without complaining at all. Like, I'm like, oh yeah. My son is just could kick their son's butt, you know, in, in this thing, you know. So it was cool to just see that. It's like, oh yeah, I don't need to be worried about everything. He doesn't have to be the best at everything, but he's really good at this, which is which is fun. That's so awesome. So, like speaking of him and your wife, like, you know, I asked you like how you've changed since the Appalachian Trail. How would they answer that question for them? Probably, I mean, my wife would probably say the same thing. She's she's really enjoying being a mom. Like I think she's um and she's joined the PTO and is really loves being involved in uh Harvey's education and the school system and going to the sports and being involved in the sports. Like she's really been enjoying that a lot. Um and she just that's that's her kind of wheelhouse. She's just great at it. And and Harvey, and I might have said this when he did the trail, like when you're a young kid, you just you think everyone does what you do. So mm-hmm. for him, he hasn't changed necessarily much except gotten stronger yeah. and his social skills have gotten good. So he, I don't think he still doesn't understand that other kids don't go out on a summer and hike 120 miles um, through a wilderness. You know, he, he probably thinks everyone does that still. I hope he continues to feel that way. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's just, it's all normal. Um yeah. So, but yeah, other than that, his social skills are, are great. He, like I said, he loves soccer. Even if he's not the best, he loves being around his friends. Um, so, you know, all the neighborhood kids are at our house all the time and he's just constantly playing with his friends. So um, before, you know, when he was four or five, you know, he didn't have friends. He just had his parents. And and now he has all his buddies around the neighborhood that he plays with every day. So it's it's been fun to watch him kind of grow up and have those relationships. Yeah. And I'm just curious, like the confidence that you've witnessed in him, like now that he's back from the trip, his mother and, and I are both a little, when we go into large groups shy, and then we yeah. open up a lot once we get comfortable with people and yeah. he's identical to us. Yeah. So if I took him yeah. to, to, to a church or to school for the first day, he's the quietest kid there. Then yeah. you give him a month and then he's the noisiest kid there. <laughs> um, so uh, so yeah, his confidence is great, but when he first meets strangers or whatever, he has a, a shyer personality to him. And and I think that's just maybe genetics because me and my wife are the same way. When we meet people for their first time, we're a little shy. Well, it could be overwhelming too. I mean, you're, when you're out on the trail, it's not like you're surrounded by hundreds of people, you know, you just meet one person at a time out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a little bit different. So you guys have been on quite a few adventures since the Appalachian Trail. Fill us in. What what are some of the things you guys have done in the last couple of years? as a family. Yeah. Yeah. Going, going back to, um, our, our mission statement, which is living a life full of extraordinary stories. Um, you know, we wanted to do something, let Harvey enjoy school and sports. So we wanted to do something every summer for right now. Um, so the year after we got back, we did, uh, 210 miles down the John Muir trail, which is in California. Mm. It goes through Yosemite all the way up to Mount Whitney. Um, all through, I mean, it's just gorgeous up there. The altitude is a lot higher, uh, snow capped mountains. Uh, it's just beautiful in California. So it's a whole different experience in different part of the country. Um, and then after that, the next year we, uh, took him to Mount Everest base camp. That's where me and his mother, before he was born, learned that we liked adventure. So we decided we would do that. Now that trip was completely different than our other backpacking trips. It was so easy because you only hiked like eight miles a day and you yeah. sleep in beds every night and people cooked for you. Um, cause you just, you did that as well, right? No, it's on my list. Hopefully coming oh, up. It's on your list. It's on yep. your list. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so he, um, but yeah, that trip is, is a lot easier. It was really cool, but that, that was amazing to see him. Uh, our guy brought his son out since Harvey was coming the first day. So we got a tour around the capital Kathmandu and, uh, you know, I, I had another little boy, his age that, barely spoke English and they just ran around the town square chasing pigeons and like we're in a third world country and and like our son's just running off with the native boy just chasing pigeons and having a great time um uh so that was a really good experience uh you know it's a little pricey to go overseas but on the other hand that was an amazing trip and then this last year summer is when me and uh Harvey uh without Cassie decided to go to back to Maine to Mount, I mean, to do the hundred mile wilderness and then Katahdin again, 
because Cassie is actually pregnant. So we're going to have another yes, kid. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. We're going to touch on that. Um, that's that's definitely something I want to chat about. I want to just uh, follow up on a couple of the adventures that you have. And this is completely yeah. like selfish because Mount Whitney is on my list. I'm curious that it was 210 miles on the John Muir Trail, you know, versus 2000 on the Appalachian Trail. But I, I'm for listeners and for me, if you could contrast what those 200 miles were like compared to what you experienced on the AT. So I don't want to take anything from the people doing the John Muir Trail. If you're training to do the John Muir Trail, you're about to do a, a crazy, amazing accomplishment. You should be proud of yourself. But for us, the John Muir Trail felt like a short vacation. <laughs> um, after doing the AT and living yeah. on the trail for 209 days, and we were we, we trained really hard and got in shape because we knew there was higher altitude there. Uh, so we were in really good shape when we got uh, arrived. And it took us, you know, three weeks ish to do the trail. So for us, it was, you know, it never rained. It rained one day. So it doesn't rain in California much. So we didn't have to worry about the rain. When it did rain, everyone else like hid and like set up their tents to hide from the rain. We just walked through because we're used to the rain and our feet and clothes dried instantly after the rain stopped. So, but yeah, that, that trip was just, it was beautiful. And I mean, it was a hard at some points, but we already had the mindset of doing crazy long miles. So three weeks just sat, felt really short for us. Um, just because our perception was different. Um, but yeah, that, the altitude was um, amazing. Just the views were, were surreal. They're, they're yeah. so pretty out there. It sounds like, I mean, for somebody that doesn't have seven months to commit to the AT, I mean, that sounds like it'd be a pretty awesome adventure. Yes. I would, I would do it again in an instant. Like besides the fact that there's so many amazing places in the world I want to go. Um, you know, if I was to go back and do another one, that, that is the perfect three week adventure. Um, if you want to do the John Muir trail, like, yeah, there's plenty of water, even though you're in California, cause you're up at high altitude, you know, as long as you're prepared for, you know, cold and hot days because the altitude when you're up high you know you get all types of different altitude changes of weather and whatnot but it's amazing and that you did that trip in the summer yeah we did it was in june did you guys need a permit for that trip we did so the, the funny story to that one is i think thank you to all my youtube followers uh we submitted for permits. Uh, we submitted three times. Cassie did one through her email. Harvey did one and I did one and we did not get a permit at all. Mm -hmm. So we decided we didn't know what we we're going to do. And we threw out a random YouTube video. And one of our subscribers, uh, a guy named Kevin, he um, had four permits that he got through the lottery system. So he got four permits and his three friends that were going to do it with him all bailed. One got injured, one wow. couldn't make it or whatever. They all bailed. And we actually met him on the trail. Uh, he was a YouTube subscriber and then hosted us um, up in Connecticut. And he was gracious enough to call us up. And he's like, this is really awkward. We only met one day or, or whatnot. Um, but I have three extra permits to do the John Muir Trail. Do you guys, wow. does your family want to come with us? And we're like, yes. <laughs> um, so if you watch that YouTube video of us doing uh, the John Muir Trail, uh, Kevin is there doing it with us, which was really fun. He was a great guy and it was cool to have just another companion hang out, hang out with us throughout the trip. Yeah, That's amazing. So the, yet another benefit of sharing your story with people and sharing your adventure. Cause I know how hard those permits to get. I, I tried to get a permit for Mount Whitney this year, um, a bunch of different times, like on the lottery date and then on the secondary dates. And I wasn't able to get one. So that's still on my list, but doing it through the John Muir trail sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And just a quick tip about the the Whitney permit. Uh, you might be able to get some walk-in permits. I mean, when we were there on the John Muir, people, there's usually one or two walk-ins available if you just show up early in the morning. Gotcha. Well, Josh, you already shared that y'all are expecting another child very soon. And yep. uh, again, don't want to give too much away here, but at the end of the movie, you look at Cassie and you said, so if we have another kid, are we going to have to come back and do the Appalachian Trail again? <laughs> yes, I did say that. <laughs> you did say that. Tell me about that conversation. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, that's something we've been joking around with uh, a bunch. Um, because, you know, we're, we're actually, we're going to have another boy. Uh, so that, so it's going to be, we're going to have two boys and they're going to be an eight and a half year difference between the two. Yeah. So it's, it's weird to have a documentary that's, you know, released all over the internet with one of your children. Um, so you would imagine the other children might be get jealous too, if they don't have their documentary. So, um, <laughs> but we're not going to promise anything because I, you know, like I said, Harvey was 
uh, healthy and strong enough to do the AT. Yeah. Um, not every kid is. So we do want to look and see what the skills and strength is of our next kid, but we definitely want to take another mini, uh, mini retirement, so to speak, um, when, when that one's around the same age. So in four or five years, we're going to do something. We don't know what it is. We're going to adapt it to that kid and make sure that um, our next son is able to do it. But the timing works out really well. My you know, Harvey, he'll be in middle school and the other one will be four or five before kindergarten. So it'd be a good time to, for us to save up between now and then to be able to make, make another cool adventure happen, depending on what that might be. Totally. I'm so excited for you guys. And uh, of course, having kids is an adventure all its own. So, you know, another month or so you'll be off on another adventure of just taking care of a little one. That's going to be pretty awesome. One thing I wanted to um, t- touch back on was when you guys talked like at the end of the, at the end of the movie and at the end of the trail, you were like concerned about getting back into the routine of life and the stresses. And, you know, it, to some degree, it almost feels like it's sort of this pendulum where you like, you know, you get out into nature, you go do this thing that's like really relaxing. It's very simplistic, very minimalistic, but it kind of fills your soul. But then, you know, the work piece is sort of what it, what, what allows most of us to be able to sustain that kind of life. And I'm just, I'm wondering if like for you guys, you've found a balance between the two. Have you figured out a way for them to sort of interact harmoniously or is it still sort of like this polarizing like dual lives. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, we don't have it figured out yet. We're <laughs> okay. working on it. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah. So one of the things I started doing, I, I mean, and again, this is just a plug for the general real estate people out there. Um, but our rental properties since COVID and stuff have started producing more and more yeah. cash flow. Yeah. Um, so we are still in the process of trying to purchase more properties and build that part of our business up because when you have any type of secondary income that can come in automatic without your day job, um, that allows you to do other options and be more creative with your time. So that's really important to us is to have that freedom. So we put a lot of focus into creating, um, creating business assets rather than just uh, just uh, just working a day job for, for money. Um, now, we do have to work a day job for money, and that's where that balance comes in. Um, but we do have a plan where as we work towards, maybe we can do less and less doing the, let's call it the day job, mm-hmm. and more doing what we want to do and, and, and passion work. Um, also, I do have a couple little side businesses I've been doing. Um, I started uh, videotaping a uh, uh, weddings actually nice. uh, i started be- because of the documentary i learned a lot about how to edit video so i started doing little documentary styles of videos for our church and then suddenly people start calling me for for weddings and stuff like that um so i've been doing that and i've really been enjoying having some sort of artistic thing instead of just spreadsheets and numbers and profits yeah. and losses um so i mean you know, that might be some avenue that later on that as I get more rental properties, maybe I can subsidize some income with traveling and doing some videography yeah. work, you know, learning cameras and learning lighting and learning audio and stuff like that. So so I am tra- trying to mix a little bit of passion with some income as well. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, we share the the same kind of passions for wealth building through real estate. That's definitely uh, something that that I've embraced as well. And I'm a huge fan of of building wealth that way. Um, I'm curious for whether it's adventure, real estate, uh, videography, if people want to work with you, get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? You know, they can reach out to us on our Instagram page, which is live sudden. They can send us a message there. Um, they can go to our website, which is also live sudden or YouTube channel at live sudden. Um, either one of those places, they could reach out to us and get in contact with us. We'd love to, to help them if they need something. Um, either way. Love it. Well, I'm going to wrap up with a couple of just a kind of a recap of a couple of fun questions that I asked you on the last episode um, when we did number one. But the first was, you know, for people that are inspired by your story and they want to step into adventure, but they haven't, you know, maybe they felt some resistance or um, your answer in your advice that you gave was just do it. It was like a plug for Nike, right? It was just like, just get out there and do it. (laughs) Don't, Don't feel your way through it. Just do it. And I'm curious if you would change that advice at all. You know, if I was to change that advice, I would change it to uh, maybe maybe start now. Um, just do it, I guess, sounds a little reckless, maybe. Um, but you got to start. For example, like I've been really enjoying videography work after helping work with this documentary and produce a documentary. Yeah. Um, 
but I was awful. So that's why I looked linked up with our church just so I could practice and just start doing little things. And if I messed up, it was just a church video, like eh, yeah. whatever. Um, it's not high stakes. So, so just maybe just get started. I love that. That's great. So I have to confess, you know, when I turned on the movie beyond the tree line, I thought I was going to see Nicholas Cage and Jennifer Garner. Because <laughs> well, I'm sorry, they didn't make it. I asked you who's going to be the actor that plays you in the movie about your life, and that's who you that's who you answered. Um, so here's really, my <laughs> do you remember that? That's funny. No, I don't. <laughs> yep. So Nicholas Cage and Jennifer Garner. So um, yeah, is there going to be another movie? Maybe we can get them for the second movie. Yeah, yeah, maybe. No, I mean, at this point, we'll have to see, uh, you know, what what we do. And like I said, for, in about four years, uh, we should should have another mini retirement. We'll do something else. Oh, man, I love it. Well, it has been so much fun to reconnect with you. And I just want to reiterate, I think I said this at the beginning of the podcast, but you were number one here on this podcast. And, you know, as you know, my personal goal was to share stories of adventure to hopefully encourage other people to listen to their own voice that calls them to adventure so that they'll get outside. But I have to tell you after 140 something episodes that you started with me, um, I felt the impacts most. And I've been on a lot of adventures. Like a lot of these conversations have inspired me to get out and do more adventures. So, you know, I'm, I'm a testimonial for sure. And so I just want to say thank you for following your own heart, following your own call to adventure, because it's those stories that inspire people like me to get out there and do more themselves. So thank you for that, Josh. And uh, for those listening, I hope you've been inspired today as much as I have. I hope Josh's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or just need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. We'd also appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word by leaving a review and sharing or tagging Inspire Campfire in your social media. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thanks for listening. Josh, thank you so much for coming back on the show. All right. Thanks, Scott.